Hi everyone. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about what I call commercial bait and switch fraud. Commercial bait and switch fraud is not like bait and switch uh, as defined in, in consumer protection laws uh, written by the Federal Trade Commission. Commercial bait and switch is not a separate cause of action, rather a, um, a, a description of an ongoing scheme over time, which I think helps really uh, give a jury something to latch onto as opposed to some of the alternatives that currently exist today that I will get into later. Uh, before I can differentiate from um, bait and switch by the FTC, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. The FTC's bait and switch really revolves around uh, what they call bait advertising. And bait advertising is defined as an alluring but insincere offer to sell a product or service which the advertiser, in truth, does not intend or want to sell. Its purpose is to switch consumers from buying the advertised merchandise in order to sell something else, usually at a higher price or on a basis more advantageous to the advertiser. The primary aim of a bait-and-switch advertisement is to obtain leads as to persons interested in buying merchandise of the type so advertised. To quickly summarize the subparts that uh, are included um, in bait-and-switch, um, the first part says that bait advertising is not allowed. The second part explores more about like what this bait advertising really does, and that creates some sort of misleading advertisement that gets customers in the door, which then the the salesperson can sort of clarify what what was so misleading, and in the end, um, convince the customer to buy something else. Part three explains more about all the different ways that the salesperson can use to actually convince this person to buy more things. That could be, uh, you know, showing them a side by side to a much better product um, that's actually presented in a much more appealing way. It can be inferred from sales statistics, or it can be just a direct, um, you know, instructions in the sales manual telling the salesman to, you know. Uh, downplay this item and shove them all towards this one that, that you can sell for a much higher margin. So something to keep in mind here is that the outcomes of an honest and a dishonest seller might not be different uh, whether or not bait and switch was actually um, outlawed. And that's because if you take a look at a situation such as uh, two car salesmen, one that is advertising a a car for a very low price but not having any on, uh, in stock and the other one that just has some that he thinks is sufficient but actually sells out. Um, for both of these times when the, when, when the first customer comes into the first car dealer or the customer that comes in right after the second car dealer ran out of stock, both of these, both of these people would be left looking at other items and eventually buying something. And according to traditional economic theory, they wouldn't buy something unless it was worth it to them. So therefore, everyone is really better off. So what, what's the harm done? Uh, the other point of view of why bait and switch is actually bad, and that's, uh, that's a point of view that explains that while the outcome for that customer might not be different, over time, and this could drive honest dealers out of the market because Another difference between those two people are that the second car salesman has to carry different inventory that they sell at lower margins compared to the first car salesman who still gets just as much traffic because of the same advertisement but is selling higher margin cars. So what ties all of the bait and switch FTC regulations together are that what's wrong is the uh, insincere the insincere offer to sell a car at a, to sell a product at a price that in reality you want them to sell something else. However, the last part of bait and switch uh, sub subsection four is the switch after the sale, and this is actually the this is a highly disfavored uh, form of bait and switch, and that's as the name implies because the the car the sorry the the salesperson is getting the customer to sign a contract first. And once the contract is 
signed, then they go through various means of discouraging them from following through with that, with that initial purchase um, in, in all of the ways described in, in subsection 3. And there's actually a movie written about, uh, about a case um, specifically about this in 1987 called Tin Man, about uh, this company that was selling aluminum siding. And they would have their customers sign, sign a contract but leave the monetary obligation blank. So once the customer signed it, the salesperson would, would bring out samples of both the, um, the very undesirable advertised product and um, followed up by the much better premium product. And all this time, the salesperson was instructed through their manual to say anything they can to get this person to not like the first advertised product and actually go with the higher priced second product. And um, as an incentive to this, the salespeople would only make commission off of the premium siding and not the advertised siding. So that's why the FTC was able to, to, to point to this company as you know, one that is being dishonest and um, engaging in bait and switch. Um, and the switch after the sale is actually the jumping off point for the example that I'm about to bring up and explain this uh, little diagram to my right about is. Uh, but for some background, this case deals with the retirement systems of Alabama, and uh, this I'm going to call it RSA, is the group that, that manages and invests the pension funds of all the public, um, state, and local employees of the state of Alabama. This case has actually been settled, uh, but all of the, all of the records are now um, in public, and that's how I put together this, this little timeline. In September 2006, RSA began negotiating with an individual named Greg Aziz on providing a short-term loan for a manufacturing facility to be built in Colbert County, Alabama. This facility would manufacture rail cars for Aziz, but it would also provide jobs and income for Alabama. The original proposal was for an initial short-term loan that would be replaced by an alternate source of funding uh, in 6 to 12 months. In March of 2007, Aziz received an estimate of $316 million for the building's core and shell, not including the equipment required to manufacture the rail cars. In July of 2007, Aziz submitted a proposal which had a $195 million estimate for the core and shell, but adding in the equipment and a $50 million startup capital, um, sort of like a working cost. The final, the final proposal was for $347 million. A week later, this proposal was incorporated into a construction loan agreement with an additional stipulation that if the project would ever exceed $10 million over budget, um, Aziz would be obligated to tell RSA so that RSA could, um, could withdraw from the agreement and seize all the assets. Uh, in 2007, uh, in, in August 2007, Aziz began construction with, um, with a subcontractor for the core in the shell that he addressed estimated at $195 million, um, but now was going to be $268 million, um, immediately $70 million over budget, which he didn't tell RSA. In October of 2007, Aziz submitted his first draw request, which included a cost spreadsheet indicating that the project was on budget, but in fact he knew that he was uh, $150 million over budget, at this point up to uh, over $500 million. During this time span, Aziz's own CFO continually told Aziz that the budget was not feasible and he eventually quit when Aziz continued to disregard him. Also during this time, Aziz represented to RSA an intent to use low interest go zone bonds as the long term funding for the project. The county in which uh, in which the facility was being built, uh, Colbert County, was not an approved county for these bonds because these go zone bonds were meant to help rebuild the Gulf Coast after Hurricane Katrina um, because these were going to be very low interest bonds. Uh, something to keep in mind is that because Colbert County was not uh, a go zone county to begin with, RSA had to lobby Congress to eventually get it included as a, um, as a go zone county, which it eventually did in July of 2008. 
However, in May of 2008, Aziz told RSA that he no longer wanted the Gozone bond um, because he wouldn't be able to get this thing called accelerated depreciation. Now, he's been told from the beginning that, acceler that accelerated depreciation would not be uh, open to him, and that's because it was an option only for revenue neutral buildings. And in this case, uh, a manufacturing facility is not revenue neutral. More strategically on the part of Aziz, though, by avoiding the Gozone bonds, he was avoiding um, he was avoiding a debt to the United States government, and instead was just going to rely on the loans that he could get from uh, from RSA. In two thousand eight, Aziz informed RSA that the project was now fifty million dollars over budget, even though the master budget showed four hundred million dollars uh, over. <coughs> Um, and all this time, whenever this was brought to Aziz's attention by some of his employees, he would tell them not to tell anybody else, not even any of the other contractors. Uh, so in, in late November, Aziz finally told RSA that to complete the project, he would need $400 million more dollars. Um, and that would need to be a long-term fund because he wasn't going forward with the Gozone bonds. Um, so from December of 2008 to February of 2009, Aziz tried to support this new proposal by telling RSA that the output of this facility was going to be 12,000 rail cars per year. Um, a couple, you know, just some, some background for that though. The demand for rail cars throughout the world is actually um, very inconsistent. And, and even at its highs, 12,000 rail cars a year is, uh, exceeds the global demand. And on top of that, Aziz had already been informed that the facility can actually really not even do 8,000 uh, rail cars a year, even if it was at full capacity. Uh, despite all of these facts, RSA went forward with the additional funding of uh, $400 million, but in exchange for that, they would get 20% uh, of Aziz's company and more oversight. Um, and it's because of that increased oversight that RSA learned of some of Aziz's misrepresentations and eventually cut off all business dealings and tried to take control of Aziz's company and um, and in the end um, that's what that's what caused the investigation by the Alabama Securities Commission. Some other little facts about what Aziz was doing during this time he was paying his company two hundred thousand dollars a month he was paying his brother uh, $20,000 a month, and he was also renting a private jet and paying for the fuel all out of the loan money, which he would use, which he and his family would use for personal uses. Um, and lastly, one of the key representations that he made was about his company and its financial strength. His first representation to RSA was that he had um, he had a zero balance on a $100 million credit line. But in reality, and what he, what he hid from statements, was he had actually extended that to $150 million, and of that, he actually owed all $150 million instead of the zero balance that he had told RSA. The result of the $700 million investment is a massive and incomplete state-of-the-art facility which was rented out for various uses um, some of which happens to be the construction of, of rail cars. But despite the income generated by, by the rent, um, it, is, it, it is increasingly uh, the case that RSA is never going to get its money back from, from this construction facility. And they, they also can't just sell it because, they, because no one would, would purchase it for uh, anywhere near the amount of money that they have sunk into it. However, when you connect that back to um, what the investigation uncovered about his use, and that's that he had he had advertised this type of project to many other types of uh, of groups, and on top of that, he actually had a history of creating buildings that were sort of like this, and in the end, when it all blew up, he would buy it back from the company that was paying him to build it for roughly pennies on the dollar. 
Um, so as I said, this case settled out of court and, and was investigated by the Alabama Securities Commission before that settlement. So connecting this back to what I originally said about how the commercial bait and switch creates one scheme instead of um, a, whole, a whole bunch of individual misrepresentations, when you can group this all together as commercial bait and switch, you connect the first misrepresentation to, to the last one. And all of them included a sale of a stock, which was a very vital point of at least the second offer. Because RSA would not have given the 400 million additional dollars uh, if not for their, their belief that the 20% stock was going to be worth something, anything. Um, so when you compare that to what currently exists for fraud, and that's either state regulations or um, UNCITRAL, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, which publishes, sorry, which published indicators of commercial fraud. Um, I believe there are 23 indicators. So instead of saying that you know Aziz's actions align with 12 of the 23 indicators or whatever it might be, you would be able, you as a prosecutor would be able to just tell a jury that this was one scheme from beginning to end and show that it's very that, that, that it had been dishonest and fraudulent the whole time, switching out what had been offered with something else again and again after, after the sale. And that, that's what uh, this diagram is about. And this is, this is showing how the first bait offer was actually switched in with the second bait offer, which was switched in with the final thing that actually happened. So this, the first offer was roughly $300 million of a short-term loan that would, that would be paid back uh, within a year. And in the end, RSA would have uh, jobs and income for the state. When that was switched after they signed on to it, they were um, put into an agreement that had $600 million or $700 million for the same for the same product, but now this would be a long-term loan instead of the short-term one that um, that they had originally bought onto for its, for its low risk. And the last switch, and what they actually got, was a very expensive yet incomplete building, incapable of of making back its how, how much it cost to build. Uh, so as as you can see, the commercial bait and switch is a much is a much easier way than you know putting up all twenty three factors and showing how and why Aziz's actions could actually be one one scheme altogether. Like it would just be much more confusing. And that's that's what that's what the point of commercial bait and switch is. Anyway, commercial commercial fraud and bait and switch have many things in common. They are both they're, they're both easily accepted as unfair trade practices and they both have not been studied that in depth. I, I briefly talked about some of the reasoning for bait and switch re regulation and we talked all year about the, the difficulties of studying and prosecuting commercial fraud. And it is and it is this it's the actions of Aziz that show how bait and switch and commercial fraud can be put together to be one hard hitting uh, term for a scheme that would otherwise be very complicated to, to understand. So while commercial bait and switch shouldn't be its own cause of action, like I said before, it can be one way to look at facts to succinctly tell a jury how and why what somebody did was fraudulent. So if, if RSA had been the, the customer for the aluminum siding that I had explained before, um, instead of the original customer that might have thought, you know, you, you get what you pay for and opting to just buy a more expensive aluminum siding, uh, RSA and disease, to continue the analogy, would be as if RSA opted to buy the lower cost uh, siding, which actually never existed. And once that happened, 
as they installed uh, something that was actually much worse that cost a lot more and in the end was blaming the weather as to why this actually cost a lot more and why he never did anything wrong. So if that had been the case, it would have combined the worst traits of bait and switch after the sale with commercial fraud, as I was saying before. And this is exactly what happened to RSA. And hopefully by analyzing these schemes through this lens, we can better describe them to juries in a way that is easily understood and remembered. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, comments, or if you just want to see any of these sources that I looked at um, for planning this presentation, please just let me know. Thanks.